Hi and welcome to the next instalment of the Oxford Centre for Personalised Medicine Flash Interview Series, where we talk to different people playing important roles in personalised medicine in one way or another. Today's guest is Dr Ed Blair from Oxford University Hospitals. Ed, hi. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Afternoon, Catherine. Um, my name is Edward Blair. Um, I'm one of the consultant clinical geneticists based up at the Oxford Centre for Genomic Medicine on the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre site. Um, I've been in Oxford now for quite a few years. I've been a consultant here for well, about 20 years, maybe slightly more. Um, my main interests are in cardiac, cardiovascular genetics, but I've got a broad sort of range in clinical practice, as well as having um, roles within the Genomic Laboratory Hub as the medical director for the Central and South. Great, thank you. So if I say personalised medicine, what does that actually mean to you? First thoughts that come in my mind, to my GP when I was growing up as a child. Um, personalised medicine was knowing the family, it was knowing everybody in the family, it was knowing all our illnesses. Um, I don't think of personalised medicine as genetics or genomics per se. I think maybe genetics and genomics is a a component of what might constitute personalised medicine. Um, one more tool in uh, what really should be good clinical practice, rather than um, being anything in, in essence, in, in something that would stand alone in itself. You know, I mean, personalised medicine might be regarded as a bit of a buzzword. That's not to, to be too offensive to people at the personalised medicine centre, but it's to me, you know, medicine is much more than just the, the tools we have in our box. And, and, and genetics and genomics is an increasingly powerful tool, um, but it's only one of many. Um, you know, when I do a cardiac clinic at the John Radcliffe on a Friday morning, I can diagnose genetic disease without doing genetic tests. If I, if I do a general genetics clinic um, in one of the district general hospitals, we can diagnose genetic disease as soon as the child stands up in the waiting area if they've got a recognisable condition. We don't, we don't necessarily need genetic or genomic tests to offer a personalised service. Um, and I certainly wouldn't see personalised medicine and clinical genetics or genomics as being one and the same thing. Um, I would see it as... Uh, you know, personalised medicine to me is really the essence of what you might call good clinical practice. It's treat, teaching each, treating each patient as an individual or each family as an individual and using all the different tools that we've got in our armory to try and help them either with a, a diagnosis or their management or their prognosis or if it's genetic conditions about managing genetic risk through prenatal diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, so if I was to summarise, Personalised medicine is good clinical practice. So from your perspective then, what have been some of the major adva like advancements in the field over the course of your career so far? The field of genetics or genomics or personalised medicine? I mean, for you say personalised medicine, I mean, like I said, go back to my primary care clinician when I was a, a nipper. You know, probably never did a genetic test, never thought about a genetic test in his life, but was a great... Um, family doctor. Um, if, on the other hand, you said, well, what are the, the, the changes um, that, you know, in, in, in genetics and genomics, if it was that sort of narrow um, element of what personalised medicine can encompass, uh, you know, where to start? Where would you start? Um, when I was interviewed for a registrar's job in, in, in genetics um, by Jane Hurst and Sue Hewson, um, must be 1995. Um, they so asked us, you know, what I saw is the sort of future of genetics and genomics. Now, I, I couldn't really articulate what that future would be, but I said, and I remember saying to them, really, geneticists are a bit like the moment, they're a bit like infectious disease doctors before we had antibiotics. And we're probably still in infectious disease doctors that don't have antibiotics. You know, we're seeing things coming through just now, you know, for treating kids with spinal muscular atrophy that just blow you away. Um, 
but it's a driver for me or the thing that sort of pushes me just now in terms of things like, you know, getting whole genome sequencing into the clinic is you think about kids with intellectual disability or, or epilepsy, and they all get lumped together as a sort of amorphous mass. These kids have severe crippling epilepsy, but we don't know, you know, if it's a potassium channel or a sodium channel or a, a GABA uh, receptor. It's only really by starting to tease that out that we get the equivalent of the gram stain, you know, gram positive and gram negative bacteria, and then understanding these diseases at a much more fundamental level that you then start to be able to develop tailored and if you like personalized treatments. Yeah. I don't know that I could say what, what would be the greatest advance um, probably in my sort of working lifetime, still, hopefully still got a fair bit of it left, but it's really been the confluence of sequencing technologies in, in IT. You know, one without the other is no good. In terms of medicine, I mean, IT is pretty good without sequencing technology. You can use it for lots of stuff, but um, it's, it's that confluence of um, sequencing technologies and IT that I've got us to a stage now where we can do tests in clinic that are absolute science fiction from when I was a registrar in 1995. Um, in 88, uh, I intercalated in genetics at university. And that year was the year that the Duchenne's gene was found. There was important work done around, you know, isolating the cystic fibrosis gene. But even then, we were a long way away from being able to offer those as, as clinical tests. And by the mid nineties, you know, we'd, we'd BRCA1 found, BRCA2 was coming down the line, but we could only test for the odd exon, targeted exon testing in BRCA1. Um, now, the, the, you know, our, our practice has, has changed beyond all recognition from, um, you know, a very sort of clinically driven uh, approach to, still clinically driven, actually, I'm going to correct myself. We are, you've got to be clinically driven. It has to be founded in that sound clinical practice, but the tools that we've now got to, try and address the issues of the families and the individuals that we are seeing in clinic with genetic conditions uh, are just light years away from where we were. Um, I won a five pound bet with one of my colleagues a couple of years ago who said we wouldn't have genomes in the clinic. And we have, you know, to all intents and purposes, the genomes now are routine test. And we, I'll sit and speak to registrars who got a child who's maybe got a few congenital anomalies or some dysmorphic features and it's, you know, look at them, you know, get a good history, sound clinical medicine, get history, look at them, examine them. But then, you know, basic tests, chromosome analysis, or CGH now, and then don't hesitate if you're still not got a diagnosis to go for whole tree or whole genome sequencing if, if, if indicated. Um, it has, it's, made, it's made a huge difference and it will make a huge difference, but I think one of the things that we're rapidly learning that in terms of actually analysing that amount of data, we're still scrapping around in the foothills. Um, the amount of data generated from a whole genome is enormous. And I think you've been involved in work and, you know, certainly some interesting papers coming from the likes of Andrew Wilkie uh, and a group in Newcastle uh, looking at um, ciliopathies where, you know, if you've really got the time, if you've got the resource to really delve into this data, um, there's a lot more diagnoses there to be made. Uh, and I think that's going to be a hard lesson for the NHS to pick up on in the next couple of years, but it will pick it up and it'll learn it and we'll realise that we need to put the resource into that analytical end of the, end of the pipeline. So I don't, think there's, I don't think I could really touch on maybe a single development but maybe that confluence of IT and sequencing technology would be the one that I'd say. Um, so can you give us any sort of specific examples where those advancements in the sequencing technology has made a real difference to patients where if that wasn't possible, they wouldn't have been able to be diagnosed? I could give you a better example than that. I could give you an example where we took a, a young girl from clinic, saw her two or three times, couldn't get a diagnosis. Um, put her through an exome or a, a genome pipeline. I, I, I'm not sure exactly which one it was. It might have been an exome where parents identified a condition that had only just been 
um, described, didn't have a nomen number yet, but made an application for mum and dad to get pre-implantation genetic diagnosis because this was an autosomal recessive condition and they really didn't um, want to risk having another child with this devastating neuro neurodegenerative disorder, but equally um, prenatal diagnosis and termination of pregnancy wasn't for them. And we had to then write to the online Mendelian inheritance in man, get a nomen number, and then get this couple referred because um, for approval for this condition for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, for which you need an omen number, that's the law in this country. And um, they're now going down the PGD route with a high likelihood that they'll have a successful pregnancy and we'll have a child, boy or girl, don't know, um, who won't have this condition. And that sort of thing would just have been impossible. We would never have made that diagnosis. We wouldn't have got to that stage without, you know, having um, a technology that allows us to cast our net far and wide. Um, and then sort of deliver that sort of level of personalised care. I keep coming back on it personalised, contradicting myself. But, you know, um, I think, you know, that's sort of it's almost closing the loop on it. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've got other examples where, you know, I've been pretty certain that um, we identified the cause of a family's condition, you know, and through, one comes to my mind, that I, 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 you know, I worry about all the time, this family, and um, there's clearly a genetic condition segregated in the family, and we'd identified a, a genetic variant through whole genome sequencing, which um, had just been reported in a number of families from Germany, and a zebrafish knockout of this gene gave you the, the same kind of phenotype in a, a zebrafish. And we were all quite excited that this segregated with a condition in the small number of meiosis there was in this family, but you know, segregated nonetheless. And um, felt that was the way to go for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And just in the nick of time, some data came out that absolutely blew that out of the water. Sadly, we've done all the tests, we've done whole genomes, we've done exome, we've done targeted testing, we still don't know what the cause of the condition is in this family. Um, but that, I think that one's the one that's the back in my mind where it tells us how easy it can be to overinterpret this data. You know, I think such. The, the, the uh, array CGH, the chromosome analysis, when that first became clinically available, I asked this to patients all the time in clinic. So if you'd asked me when we first had this test, um, will there be people walking about in the general population who've got large chunks of extra chromosome missing or extra? I would have gone, no, you know, they would all have, they'd all have conditions like intellectual disability. And they don't, you know general population that is absolutely full of people who've got massive extra bits. And it's the same with the, you know, whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing, you know, the background level of genetic variation is enormous. You know, when we say to patients, I'll say to patients, how many genetic differences is there between your genome and mine? Three, four, five, six million? And they go, no, really? Yeah, something like that, of that order. You know, and we've got to try and find this one potential, one genetic letter out of 3,000 million. The same number of seconds as there is in 95 years. Another phrase I, I use in clinic to show them the size of this data set that we're generating. One second out of 95 years. And um, very, very easy to pick on the wrong, the wrong bit of data, the wrong variant. And we've all got new mutations. We've all got new variants that aren't present in mum and dad. And if you find one of them and you go, oh, it's new in that person, it's de novo, it must be the cause of the problem. That way problems lie. And we'll make a lot of those mistakes in the next few years. We'll make a lot of those because we're, we're, we're surgeons that don't know what anatomy yet. Uh, we, we haven't scoped out the anatomy, the human genome, and all that anatomical variation that we need to understand. I guess that brings me on to then my final sort of set of questions of where you see the field of personalised medicine going in the next five to ten years and 
something you've answered to an extent already, what the major challenges of further integration of personalised medicine into the clinic might be? Well, it depends on what definition of personalised medicine we're going to use. So if you take my initial definition of personalised medicine being good, sound clinical practice, or one of the, the tenets of good, sound clinical practice, I hope that doesn't go anywhere in the sense of I hope we always keep that. Um, if you're talking about personalised medicine in the sense of genomics, and that's a narrower personalised sense, um, Again, I hope we don't forget that it should needs to be clinically based. If we try and turn this into a black box, sequence data in, diagnosis out, we'll get a, we'll get a lot wrong. Um, we need to understand the, the limitations of the technology and our ability to actually interpret the data that's coming out. And it has to be absolutely foundations of it have to be sound clinical practice. If we're using this for medicine, you know, I'm just talking about this sort of very narrow, almost one-on-one -on -one patient doctor type relationship. I'm not talking about massive population genetic data sets and that sort of thing, big data, which is something that's probably beyond my scope. Um, although in saying that, there is, you know, things that we'll use it for, for individual patients. Um, so I, I hope that we keep it grounded in sound clinical practice. Um, I hope, what, do I, what would I like us to be able to do is, I, I, but we're going to get better at doing it. We, are, we will just get better. We can't, probably can't get any worse. Um, where do we going to be five years? I find that such a, a difficult question. Someone that we got asked on a, a conference call last week about where, where's this, program going to be in 2030 and I find that really difficult to 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 sort of get my head around we're going to have wider engagement we're going to have um, greater knowledge and understanding we need to have this tool taught in medical schools and nursing training and pharmacy training um, we need to have the clinical specialities where it really impacts virtually all of them, maybe not trauma medicine, but virtually all of them. We need to have all those specialists training in that. So in oncology, in neurology, and in pediatrics, and immunology, and ophthalmology, and all the rest of them where people are going to be employing genetic tools. I want, I would hope that it's, uh, medical schools will be churning out medically savvy doctors and nursing colleges will be producing um, genetically savvy nurses and midwives and schools of pharmacy will be doing the same for the pharmacists. Um, so I see much broader engagement. I see much broader uptake. I would hope for a more better trained workforce. Um, that's not to cast any aspersions on anybody just now, but if it's not part of your role, you're not using these tools, why should you be necessarily be trained in it or, or be comfortable with it? So there's huge training and education programme to be undertaken. Um, I worry slightly about the idea that um, anybody can do genetics. I think, you know, anybody can do genetics, but, you know, whether there is a genetic speciality, if there is special knowledge and special skills in, in people like me, clinical geneticists. I think there is, but I, I worry that it's seen as, you know, this is just going to become like a big machine that just churns out data. Um, so I would hope that there's still a, a role for the clinical geneticists in this in the future. Might be completely different to what we're doing now because, um, what I do now is completely different to what I started off doing in 1995 when I was a registrar. And, you know, we did chromosome tests and fragile X for children with intellectual disability. And it was a bit like, mm, what else now? But I'm not a great, uh, you must have actually made me realise I'm not really a great um, future prospector. That's twice now I've been asked this question, really. Maybe I need to sit down and have a proper think about it. But it's maybe not my role. We tell other people what the future is going to be like. 
Um, and that's for you know the youngsters and new ones coming through to decide. I, I just it's a, it's incredible if we're talking just you know about genetics and genetic technologies, the tools we've got are utterly incredible. Um, we just need to let make sure we use them in the right way, get the best benefit from them. We're not there yet. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, really enjoyed the interview and all the best. Thank you.